This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. This is Robert Blumen, editor of Software Engineering Radio. If you're hearing this, that means you're a listener of the show. But have you ever thought about being a host? It's a great way to talk to some of the most interesting people in the industry and get 30 to 40,000 people to hear your thoughts. Contact us, team at sc-radio.net, for more information. Are you looking for a better way to track your engineering backlog? Do you want a project management tool that's both powerful and a joy to use? Give Clubhouse a try. Designed for software teams, Clubhouse is a fast, modern alternative to conventional project management tools that are either too complex or too simple. Start your free trial and get two extra free months at clubhouse.io slash se radio. Welcome to Software Engineering Radio. I'm your host, Gavin Henry, and today my guest is Justin Richer. Justin Richer is a security architect, software engineer, standards editor, and systems designer with nearly two decades of industry experience. He is the lead author of OAuth 2 in Action and contributor to OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Justin was the editor of the OAuth extensions RFC 7591, 7592, 7662 and wrote Vectors of Trust RFC 8485. Justin is also the co-author of the US Federal Digital Identity Guidelines, NIST SP 800-63, He's also the editor of the Heart Specifications, as well as contributing editor to UMA2. Quite impressive. He is also the founder and maintainer of the MITRE ID Connect open source project and the OAuth XYZ security protocol project. Justin, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Is there anything I missed in your bio that you'd like to add? <laughs> uh, no, thank you very much for having me on. Um... Yeah, that's uh, it's definitely a bit of an alphabet soup in the bio there. So uh, I'm I'm impressed that you got through all of the RFC numbers and and everything. It's yeah, first time. There'll be um tons of links on the show notes, so we can all look up the RFCs. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so during the show we'll be talking about OAuth two, the industry standard protocol for authorization. I'd like to start with an overview of what OAuth two is and move on to some key features and then go through some specific examples. Uh, Justin, can you explain briefly what OAuth is and the difference between version one and two? Absolutely. OAuth a lot of times gets spoken of as an authorization protocol because it's all about allowing a piece of software to do something for you. But if you get down into the weeds of what the protocol is actually doing, what it's really about is it's actually a delegation protocol. OAuth allows you to have a user who's got a certain set of rights to an API and allow that user to say, hey, I want this piece of software that I'm using to use this API on my behalf. So the user's not really setting authorization policies and it's not something like, you know, Zacamol where you're, you're setting up things that, um, you know, when I see this kind of request, this is the kind of result that I'm looking for. Instead, OAuth is a protocol that allows you to set, um, you can think of it as a service-specific password in an automated fashion. So your application, instead of taking in your username and password, you can use OAuth to get what's called an OAuth access token that can access the API in your stead so that the application never sees your credentials, never even needs to necessarily know who you are. It just uh, has to go through the OAuth process and get this token, and then that token sort of allows the software to act on your behalf. Okay. Uh, now you asked OAuth 1 and 2. The differences are, conceptually, they're very similar. They're both delegation protocols. So they both allow a piece of software to act on a user's behalf. But the differences are largely around how they do that and the assumptions that were made in their design. Now, back when OAuth 1 was designed, uh, literally in a back room at OzCon, uh, back in 2006, think of what the internet looked like in 2006. The biggest website was MySpace. Like, 
iPhone and Android weren't a thing. That's only 13 years ago, you know. It's... Right? It's it's an absolutely different world. It's it's mind-blowing to uh, to think of that. So what OAuth 1 was trying to do was connect two websites to each other. And it did a pretty decent job at that. And it actually did so well that big companies like Google and Yahoo and a bunch of others drop support of their proprietary versions of delegation protocols, AuthSub and BBAuth and a bunch of others that sort of influenced OAuth, they drop support for their proprietary versions and instead used this new open standard that kind of came out of the community. Now, OAuth 1 kind of suffered from its success because people started using it and it came about right around when the internet as we know it was changing, people were starting to build API-driven websites, mobile applications were starting to become a more important uh, thing in the way that people are interacting with things on the web, uh, or even what we know of as you know interacting on the web and on the internet uh, at all. And so a lot of the assumptions that went into OAuth 1 really weren't fitting with all of the different places that people were trying to use it. So a group of us got together and tried to take the best parts of OAuth 1 and sort of streamline it into a sort of core protocol that people could use in a variety of different ways. So while OAuth 1 was a monolithic protocol, there was only one way to do everything all the time, OAuth 2 is more of a it's, it's a bunch of ingredients that's packed with some common recipes that say like, oh, you've got a web server-based application. Oh, you've got a in-browser application. You've got a server-to-server -server application. Here's how you take these parts and put them together to do that. But also with the flexibility to come up with your own ways to make your own recipes, if you will. Excellent. That brings me on to the next section where I want to break those scenarios down into a couple of examples. So you mentioned in the intro there that the fundamental use is so a user or something that's trying to access a protected resource mm -hmm. doesn't get your private credentials, i.e. In, in this a first example, username and pa password. Right. Because if you change that password like you're supposed to do, you'll then have to change it everywhere mm -hmm. all the time. So I think most of us are used to seeing this type of interaction when we allow another application to access our details for example uh, say dropbox or logging in with a google account or basically just approving access for something which i would put into the traditional web-based client server type model mm -hmm. yeah that's that's really the world that oauth came from and it really was a reaction to you know uh, web apis were being built and deployed with this pattern of just protecting them, protect them with HTTP basic auth and just ask for the user's username. Some of the biggest problems with that are not just the fact that you're exposing the user's password, but also once you have the user's username and password, there's no differentiating between the user doing something interactively themselves and something acting on that user's behalf. Yeah, so when you come to like audit logs and figuring out what went wrong exactly it's just this user logged in and we only know it's that user because we saw their password but it might not have been them because it might have been a piece of software that they had typed their password into 12 months ago we we really have no way to tell the difference um, and the oauth token based model allows you to basically create a new credential that represents just that piece of delegated software working for that user instead of that user and all of the rights that they may have to whatever API it is that you're protecting. Okay. And uh, I also just wanted to, uh, to touch on something you mentioned uh, real quick, if I may take a quick aside. Yeah, sure. And um, you mentioned changing passwords like we were supposed to. So a lot of the conventional wisdom that people have today is that you're supposed to change your passwords regularly, you know, every six months, every year, or something like that. And um, as one of the major revisions in the NIST Digital Identity Guidelines, one of the things that we did was we actually rescinded that advice. Okay. Because uh, research has shown that that actually causes users to create weak passwords. People, at the end of the day, are going to need to type these things in. They're going to need to remember them. So they're going to come up with an easily guessable and easily uh, exploitable pattern. 
So the advice is now to change your password only if there's been a suspected breach or in terms of like, you know, you are revalidating the account and, you know, reproofing somebody uh, after an absence or something like that, then yes, definitely change your credentials then. But if you don't suspect a breach, you should not be changing your passwords regularly and certainly don't make your users do it. And this goes back to what was mentioned in your bio, the NIST SP800. Yeah. Yep. SP800-63 version 3. Okay, thanks. But obviously the advice still stands of don't use the same password for all your services. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the key strengths that the OAuth token-based model gives you is that just as nearly a side effect of this protocol, you get a new password, if you will, a new token for every single service and for every single client application. So if you have five different client applications all using the same API, so say you've got Twitter on your phone, you've got TweetDeck in your browser, uh, you've got you know a uh, Twitter on your tablet, all of those are going to be using different tokens when they go talk to the API because they are computer generated and the user never even has to see them. So they don't have to be memorized, they don't have to be memorable, and the user doesn't have to manage them at all. It all happens automatically within the software. And that automatically allows both sides of the table, as it were, to monitor who's doing what because everyone has a different identifiable access token. Right, exactly. That's where you can and a lot of large providers have started doing uh, heuristic-based monitoring of uh, API access. So it's not just, oh, we saw your credential and we're going to let you in. It's like, we saw your credential, the timing makes sense, you're, it doesn't look like you're in a weird time zone, it doesn't look like you're coming from a weird network, you know, we've maybe got some device fingerprinting that our installed mobile app can do that we can check against what you've done before. And all of that uh, can be tied to this access token over time. Yeah, and that, that's similar to what your banks do at the moment, isn't it? If you're mm -hmm. pretty much based in the UK or the US, and then all of a sudden a transaction pops up in Italy, mm -hmm. then they know something's wrong and you'll get an email or a call. Yeah, and uh, the financial industry has had a lot of practice in, um, in detecting anomalies like this. Uh, one of the interesting things that we're seeing, though, is that in the financial industry, if something goes wrong, the bank can put your money back. Like they, they have funds that like if somebody steals money and okay, we can we have insurance and we can put this back, but you can't give somebody back privacy. You can't give somebody back data that's been stolen and copied. Once it's leaked, it's leaked, yeah. Exactly, and so we're seeing a lot of these uh, technologies that have been uh, pioneered in other in other realms being applied in ways where the actions that you have to do once you figure out something is amiss are are really different and in a lot of cases they're they're not necessarily well known ahead of time like people haven't fully figured out how you give somebody back privacy like you know when their medical record leaks like w we don't even necessarily know what to do with that yet we're figuring that out pretty much now yeah, because the traceability, you know, it's like, for example, when someone famous, a, a video of them gets posted on Twitter or something or shared, mm -hmm. you can trace the original share, but you don't know if it's a picture has been taken or, you know, once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah, and that gets into the nature of digital media. To view something, you have to copy it first. That's just how networks work. Yeah, the nature of digital media is that you have to copy it before you can view it. Uh, so when something goes across the network, it of necessity exists in both places, both the sender and the receiver. And as soon as I have viewed it, I have a copy of it. And I quite frankly can remix that and do whatever I like on my end with my software and then republish that in a format that's maybe got a caption on it, maybe got a border on it, maybe is part of some larger piece. Uh, maybe it's clipped down, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you, that can be done. And so, yeah, you're absolutely right that uh, it's, it's not as simple as just tracing, oh, this is where the leak first happened, because, you know, as, as a lot of breaches of data have shown us, it's the, it's kind of that long tail of after effects, uh, where the, the really interesting and strange things start to happen. 
Yeah, because if you if you have as fine grain control as we'll touch upon shortly, once it's been leaked or out there, it's like not having any protection at all. Yep. Given that example. And of course, always fighting against this is the notion that, you know, it's easy to just keep everything locked up and never share it, but people want to share things, but only on their own terms, you know? So a system that just doesn't allow data go out ever, nobody's going to use it. Nobody's going to care. And so it's, it's a constant balance. So where does the nature of um, trust come in? So if we take the example I want to start off with, which is the traditional web-based client server. So I'll go on to a website. I can't be bothered to sign up for it. So I'll use the sign up with Facebook or sign up with Google, which I know behind the scenes is the OAuth2 type interaction. The pop-up or the redirection will happen and I'll, I'll say the app I'm logging into wants access to your Facebook email, other things. Because I'm a technically savvy user, if that application's asking for my date of birth or my friends list, I'm, I'm immediately concerned about that. But if it's just saying, I just want to share my email so I don't have to type in my password, how can I trust it? This is an ongoing area of research of how to manage these consent and authorization uh, ceremonies with users in ways that both inform them and also don't necessarily just scare people off unnecessarily. Would you like to take us through the sort of traditional web-based client server OAuth2 dance? So you are the user logging on to a website. All right. So I'm actually going to use an example of not logging on to a website okay. because, um, as you know, and as many of your listeners know, that would be an authentication transaction. That's that's identity. That's figuring out who's there. OAuth fundamentally is delegating authorization. So let's say that instead of logging onto a website, uh, what I'm trying to do is, uh, you know, the canonical example from the OAuth world is say I've got a bunch of photos and I want to send them to a photo printing service. All right, somebody who's going to make, you know, nice little bounded book and mugs and things like that. I need to get my photos there. Traditionally, sure, I could have like downloaded them and then re-uploaded them to the website, but it's a lot easier if I can go to the photo printing service and say, hey, my photos are hosted over here. You know, you speak this API, I, I will just allow you to go get my photos from over there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up at the photo printer. The photo printer at this point has no idea who I am. Maybe I create an account or whatever, but that's all just local to the photo printer. And it's going to say, oh, I know how to speak photo storage site, right? Maybe it's Dropbox, maybe it's OneDrive, maybe it's Flickr, maybe it's Facebook, you know, whatever. I know how to speak this API. So if you allow me access to this, I'll go get your photos so that we can print them and, you know, you can make your family calendar or whatever. So what the user is going to see is they are going to end up being redirected over to their photo storage site. And again, this is all web-based applications. So I'm going to be sitting in my browser at the photo printer and it's gonna say, you know, click here to go get your photos from over there. So I'm gonna like, okay, I'm gonna click here and we'll just, we'll use Dropbox as an example. So I'm gonna click here and I'm gonna be sent to Dropbox. And then while I am at Dropbox, there are things within that redirect that Dropbox will be able to recognize that this is an OAuth transaction. So the Dropbox server is able to say, oh, this is a request for photos connecting to, into the API. Drop, Dropbox now needs to know who I am. So I can authenticate there. Dropbox can maybe give me multi-factor challenges, maybe, uh, you know, ping me on a device that it already knows is pre-registered. Dropbox can do whatever it wants here. The underlying OAuth protocol absolutely doesn't care. All Dropbox cares about is that it knows who I am and it's sure that it knows who I am. That way it knows whose photos are gonna be passed along. Dropbox can then prompt me and say, oh, hey, you know, photo printing site, uh, you know, Snapfish or whatever, wants to be able to print photos that are stored here. And so I can say, well, yeah, I was just there wanting to get my photos printed and they want access to my photos. This all makes sense. So I'm going to hit this. I'm going to go back there. I can tell as a user, I can very easily knit together a story and to tell myself 
as to what's going on between these two systems. So then I get sent back to the photo printer site. At that point, the photo printer site has a little piece of information called an authorization code, which it can then go talk directly to the photo sharing site and say, oh, hey, somebody, I don't know who it is. I don't know their username. I don't know who you know them as. I don't even know what this is necessarily good for because nobody told me, just somebody gave me this code. You know, I want you to validate this. And I'm also going to, uh, you know, uh, the photo printing site is going to authenticate itself so that the photo sharing site knows that it's them that's asking. And it's going to hand that code over and say, all right, if this is good, then give me something that I can use to actually access your API. So at that point, I've walked up to the print service. I've looked to see what storage services it supports. I've done my Dropbox. Click Dropbox. The print service knows that it works with Dropbox. So it's redirected me to the standard Dropbox prompt to say Snapfish or whoever wants to access your account. At that point, the photo service doesn't know who I am and doesn't care about anything to do with me. It just knows that it's off to go and speak to Dropbox. I'll then do SMS verification, one-time password, or whatever I've set up on my Dropbox account. Yep. And then the application or the service requesting access to my storage has got the first step of the process, which is the users authorize me to access, and I've got this authorization token, but I still can't do anything with it yet at this point. Exactly. That authorization code isn't enough on its own to access the API. That needs to be presented back to Dropbox to our photo storage site in concert with authentication of the printing site. Because when the user authorized this, they did it in the context of presumably coming from a specific photo printing site. And so that context needs to come back and be applied to uh, alongside this authorization code. So when that shows up, the photo storage site can now say like, oh yeah, I recognize this authorization code. I issued it and I issued it fairly recently um, because you know this transaction is gonna take a matter of seconds at most. So these things are not long lived. And in fact, I issued it to this specific photo printing site. And so what I want to be able to do is give this photo printing site something that will allow it to access the photo storage APIs, but only for the user that authorized and only for whatever parts of the uh, API that the user authorized it for. And, and that second bit of requirement is what the service asked Dropbox to be able to do. So on the, the thing it presents, the user it says, this service wants to access your files. Yeah, exactly. Although the um, what I've painted is a highly idealized version of it. Reality gets really squirrely really fast. Okay. Because you've got the convolution of what the uh, printing site, which would be the client in OAuth parlance, mm -hmm. uh, what the client has requested, what the user has authorized, what's even available at the API, because not all APIs are, are built the same, you know, maybe I get only read access. Maybe I get only image data and not metadata, mm -hmm. you know, because what does a printer need to know the lat longs that are associated with my photos, right? Exactly. Not gonna, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be given that information unless I have, unless they have a need for it. But the API needs to be able to support that level of granularity and the user needs to be able to have approved that. All of that gets sort of bundled up uh, the result of all of that, rather, gets bundled up into this access token, which is what then gets handed back to the client. Okay. But the access token is the next step after they've got the authorization token. Mm -hmm. uh, authorization code. Code, uh, yeah. To be, yeah, to be pedantic. Okay, that's good. So the photo service has got the authorization code. How does Dropbox or the storage system mm -hmm. prove or, or challenge that the printer service is legitimate and it's who it thinks it is? That's a great question. And it's, it's germane to sort of uh, where OAuth finds itself today as opposed to when OAuth 2 was ratified, which was between 2010 and 2012. Not quite an entire internet age away, but getting close to it. 
So when OAuth 1 was written, it was assumed that it was always websites talking to other websites. And so that all client applications and all authorization servers would have access to effectively shared secrets that they could prove possession of at all times. Mm -hmm. OAuth 2 at least admitted that not all client applications are able to do that. If you have, for example, an instance of a mobile application on one phone, and then you have the same instance of that mobile application on a thousand other phones, if you're pre-packing a secret into all of those mobile applications, it's not very secret anymore. And it's not particularly great at uh, truly confirming and identifying it. But at the time, the most common and most canonical use case was still two web servers talking to each other. And in those cases, the client application, in this case, the photo printer, goes and tells the authorization server, hey, I got this authorization code, and here's this secret that I have that proves that I am this specific application. And this is what I uh, am going to use to identify my application that is asking on behalf of this specific user. Because that client secret is probably something Dropbox has given it when it did its integration to get access to Dropbox and get listed on the approved apps or, you know, integrations. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the uh, the assumption and honestly the practice is in a lot of cases you have uh, what's called a static registration. So a developer or sysadmin for the client application pulls up a console or sends in an application. So a developer or a company right. would go to their developer console or their developer program, sign all the contract. Exactly. And so that, you know, you know who to sue when something goes wrong. This is, mm -hmm. this is a static registration. And so they fill out all of the contact information, fill out all of the information about the application and things like that. And then at the end of that, they get issued an identifier and a secret. Uh, that identifier is what gets sent through the browser when the user gets redirected. That's how we know that it's at least probably going to be this application that's asking for it, though it is a public piece of information. Anybody can see it. Anybody could pretend at that stage. But it's when it comes back with the authorization code that you actually see the secret, which nobody else should have access to. Yeah, so the initial token could be stolen or fished or whatever but it's not until it's challenged when it sends it back to get the actual access right exactly and with web servers and sort of all other variables being relatively equal that's a pretty decent way to uh, protect access to these tokens to keep them from being issued to malevolent parties mm -hmm. since you mentioned mobile apps I think we could move on to that and come back to a bit more detail on the yeah, of course. traditional client server. You obviously can't have a client secret saved on a device because normally that would be the photo services backend systems that are protected mm -hmm. and it's only known to that company. What options are open to mobile app developers to use a standard-based protocol like OAuth 2? So that's a great question. And that's... Again, one of the key differences in OAuth 2 was admitting that mobile apps existed. Okay. Because, well, it, when OAuth 1 was, uh, was brought together, they kind of didn't. I mean, there were heavyweight desktop applications, of course, but not the type of app and API economies that we have today. And we should probably define a mobile apps. Ah, yeah, great point. We're not talking like... Um... Safari or Firefox browser on a device. We're talking about either right. a native app that's written in Swift or Java, mm -hmm. Android or iOS, or some type of wrapper around that. But it lives on the device. It has access to the storage. It might be through the same APIs as a browser can save things, but fundamentally it's saving a token or some type of data on that device. Right, exactly. It's something that runs and lives and executes on the device itself and outside of the context of the system browser. Mm -hmm. So it may have, it may make use of web and browser-based technologies, but it's not necessarily a browser-based application because it's not something that you're fetching from a remote server and running inside your system browser with all of your 
cookies and sessions and tabs and everything else. It really is running in its own own little world, own little space. It's interesting to make that point today because, again, that was something that that wasn't really a thing that people were doing when we were writing OAuth 2. There was a much brighter line between web-based applications, browser-based applications, and native applications. So stuff that was running on a desktop or on a mobile platform. These days, the technologies, uh, you've, you know, JavaScript runs absolutely everywhere, and there's all sorts of wrappers and repackagers and cross-compilers and, and things like that for lots of different languages and platforms, uh, such that you don't really... You can't predict how an application is going to function based on just the language that it's written in anymore. Okay. So the main difference, though, is sort of the assumptions of the execution environment uh, and the interaction methods that are available to that application. Yeah, so you could treat the, we'll call it a native app, as the back-end system of the service. Mm -hmm. So your options might be to present the user with a login, so you put in your username and password, mm -hmm. or there's some type of automatic registration of that application. Right. So uh, the options for dealing with these mobile apps are, or native apps in general. As you mentioned, you could take, uh, instead of doing a static registration, you could do what's called a dynamic registration. Okay. And this is where the instance of the client application software, it wakes up. It knows that it's in order to talk to this API, it needs to go talk to a specific OAuth authorization server, but it's going to wake up and realize it doesn't have a client identifier. It doesn't have any client secrets or keys or anything like that associated with it. It needs to go get the, something. But it would know it would know the endpoint. That's probably the bare minimum it would need. Exactly, and even then, um, there are extensions to OAuth that allow for resource-based discovery for uh, for common APIs, uh, such as OpenID Connect, that you can discover all of that from a single piece of user input. But once you know which authorization server you need to talk to, the client software basically shows up and makes a call directly to the server and says, hi, I'm a piece of software. This is what I'm called. Here's where my homepage is. Here's the contact email of my developer. Here's my redirect URIs. These are the kinds of keys that I can manage. Let's go. And the server then can make sense of that request and come back to the client with a client identifier, most importantly, and in a lot of cases, a client secret. Now, we had just said before that if you have a mobile application and it's installed on a million different devices, you know, a client secret's not secret anymore. Mm -hmm. But that's only if you put the secret into the software before it goes out. That's what I would call a configuration time secret. Right, something that happens in the developer's hands, part of the build process or deployment process, like that's not going to stay secret. But if we can turn that into a runtime secret, then mobile apps do just fine with that. Yeah, you know, uh, if you're using best practices for system storage, there's even uh, security enclaves where you can store things on today's platforms that are covered by localized biometrics. There's a lot of things that you can do to store and manage runtime secrets. Yeah, you could install it on OS's keychains or iCloud or whatever operating system it is. You could store it for the lifetime of the apps on and then it does the dance again. But how, when it comes alive and says, I'm here, I need to do something, what what do you use in that process to prove that that client is something you know about or you allow access? So it turns out that's a really, really difficult thing to do in the real world. And there are a handful of approaches to that chicken and egg, isn't it? It really is, uh, because there's really no difference between interoperability and unknown request from an unknown third party. Like if you're being truly end to end, like open and interoperable, people can just show up and start speaking your, pro speaking your protocol. That's, that's kind of the point, but that's also kind of the problem. And, um, so we've got some things built into the dynamic client registration protocol in OAuth. And um, I should probably here point out that uh, I served as the editor in the IETF for that, for that specification. Yeah, that's RFC 7591. And we'll have a link there, right? Yeah, I've got that already, don't worry. All right, fantastic. Is this a new extension to OAuth 2? 
No, no, that's um, that is now several years old. I would honestly. It's, it's in your up. book, so it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. it's 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 quite a few years old at this point. It's it's pretty well established. So it's not something exotic, above and beyond a normal interaction. Uh, not really exotic, and it's certainly it's not a it's not a very complicated protocol. That's for sure. But uh, what it is though is it's something that lets you set up the environment for, uh, especially for native apps, but web server based apps can use this too, and browser based apps can use this too. It sets up the environment so that all of those assumptions about which secrets are in place, which identifiers are in place before the OAuth protocol even starts those can all actually be put there beyond just developer. Okay. If you couldn't, or if you didn't want to use the dynamic registration type model for a browser or a mobile app, what options would you have to not do? Well, in OAuth 2, you need to have a client identifier. No, no matter what. No matter what. I mean, that's that's absolutely core to the protocol. And so you need to get it in there, whether it gets configured, whether it, uh, it gets built in as part of the deployment, because you could have, for example, sort of a device and platform management system that when it issues an instance of an application, it can do the registration and pack that stuff into the that instance for you. Uh, so it can... You could have a backend system do the dynamic registration at install time. You know, that's that's an option. Uh, at which point you can start using some of the additional protections that we have built into the dynamic client registration protocol in ways that make sense. So when you do that initial registration, you're allowed to pass on uh, two things that could help identify you. The first of those is uh, what's called a software statement. This is a signed assertion. It's actually a JSON web token. Uh, format that basically just says these are the attributes that this client should be asking for you know whoever shows up with this this is sort of the uh, the fingerprint of this application if you will and it's been signed by a third party's trusted key so that doesn't necessarily mean that whatever piece of software is presenting it is supposed to be presenting it because we've never seen the software before if they had signed it with their own key we have no way of knowing it's their own key because we've never talked to them before. But what it does at least allow us to do is look at a piece of software and say that, oh, it's at least going to behave in a certain way. So if somebody is going to uh, be impersonating an application to the point of impersonating their redirect URIs and their home pages and everything like that, we're going to see more anomalous behavior on that specific application, that's something we can at least try to look out for. And that's an attack we have to look out for anyway, because of, you know, locally modified applications and, you know, captured systems and whatnot, then we can use that software statement to kind of lock down the behavior during the registration process. So that if one of those software statements starts getting abused, we can effectively put a lasso around everybody that used that software statement and go, okay, you know what? We're gonna yank that back and we're gonna issue a new software statement through some trusted out of band channel, however we got it to you guys in the first place maybe, that you have to use from now on. And anytime we see this old one or any registrations based on this old one, we're not gonna honor them anymore. Yeah, because you've got quite a lot of options in the in what you call the dance to detect anomalies. There's lots of requests for um, grants and codes, you know mm -hmm. something's up. Whereas if it's just someone logging in and clicking send, you, you block them. But at that time, they've got you know more information they sh than they should. Right. So say you have an application that is that you know is a mobile application, and so they've signed up to use the authorization code grant type, mm -hmm. and somebody tries to do a dynamic registration of that that signs up to use the implicit grant type. Okay. Well, you immediately know something's up because you're, that, that piece of software is not supposed to have that piece of functionality. Somebody's trying to do something weird. And um, so that's something that you can kind of immediately start to lock down and detect. And that's just a very simple, superficial example. Summer's longer days and slower pace invite us to pick up a book, follow our questions, and try our hand at something new. 
The work of modern software developers is evolving in ways that are both challenging and rewarding. As a developer, it's essential that you cultivate a security mindset. To help, we put together a collection of information security books, podcasts, blogs, and hands-on exercises, recommended by Vericoders across our development, security, and product teams. From a just-published page-turner to classic frack articles, there's something here for everyone who's interested in becoming more security-minded. So dip your toes in or take a deep dive. Visit www.vericode.com summer today. I think I'm going to loop back just to get some clarification. I didn't do it at the time, but the open ID, if we could briefly touch on that, mm -hmm. then I'd like to dig into what everyone has kind of standardized on for the token part, because in the spec, it's it wasn't clear, but it is now that the, the JSON web tokens is sort of the preferred manner. And then we can dig into the different grant types, which will help us pick which one to use for which specific use case in the examples. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And no, that's that's a great set of topics, especially because the JSON web token is not necessarily the preferred type. But we'll get back to that in just a sec. I look forward to it. So uh, OpenID, yeah. and specifically OpenID Connect, was built as an identity layer on top of OAuth 2. Okay. When OpenID Connect was being ratified, we looked at sort of the classic OpenID systems, which were a you know, a redirect based, very, very website focused identity protocol mm -hmm. and OAuth 1, which was a very website focused authorization protocol. And it was really, really, really difficult to cram the two together, even though people wanted to, because as it turns out in the real world, nobody wants pure authentication. Nobody wants to just know, oh, you have logged in the end and I don't care anything else about you. I don't want to access anything. I just want to know somebody logged in. Nobody ever does that. Uh, similarly, nobody ever does pure authorization. They almost always want to know something about the user, even if it's just a display name or an email address so that they can contact the user if something goes wrong with their printing order, for example. Okay. So people were very, very interested in using these two technologies together. But when we were developing OAuth 2, you know, so I helped work on both OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. Neither, I will be very clear that neither was my idea. I'm not taking <laughs> that much credit for it. I was just fortunate enough to be part of those conversations. But the idea with OpenID Connect is that you start with this authorization protocol of OAuth 2, right? Uh, you have the user show up and, you, and they're authorizing access to something. And that's the key bit is that it's an authorization protocol. Exactly. But the question is, what are they authorizing access to? Okay. With OpenID Connect, what you are authorizing access to is your identity information. So you treat your identity instead of you're treating the authentication as the primary thing. I have to know who you are and then I'll figure out, you know, what I'm going to let you do. First, like whoever you are, authorize me to do things and one of the things i want you to authorize is for me to know who you are so it kind of flips things on their head but in a way that actually makes a lot of sense because alongside of who you are i also want to know all right so now let me download your pictures so that i can print them right now let me post to your news feed now let me send messages to your friends you know whatever else that i wanted to do with it, that api is in addition to knowing who you are mm -hmm. And as a consequence, OpenID Connect and similar identity protocols that are out there are really, I would say, far and away the most common uses of OAuth 2 that we've got. And unfortunately, that means that many, many, many people think of OAuth 2 as an authentication protocol or as, an, as a login system. Yeah. Because there are so many login systems that are based on that. And... Um, to, to clear this up, you know, my favorite metaphor from this, uh, I stole this from a fantastic engineer named Vittorio. If you treat OAuth, think of it like chocolate, all right? It is a fantastic ingredient. You can have it on its own, but you can also make a lot of different recipes with it. Authentication and OpenID Connect, that's more like a chocolate cake. You know, it takes a few different ingredients put together in the right way to come up with this specific thing. And can you make a uh, cake without chocolate? Absolutely. There's a lot of different ways that you can throw a few common things together. 
But when you're having chocolate cake, you're you're noticing the chocolate. You're noticing that that you know that's kind of the key thing that's standing out, even though it's coming to you in the form of this cake. Although there are a lot of other ingredients that have to go in there. I like it. The other thing is that you can make a lot of different things with chocolate. You can make chocolate fudge. You can make you know chocolate cream pies. You can you can make you know hot cocoa. Lots of different things with it that have nothing to do with chocolate cake. OAuth and OpenID are really the same way. And OpenID Connect was an attempt to, you know, to overstretch the metaphor here, come up with a, an international standard for chocolate cake recipes. So that when uh, people are building an identity protocol, like here's something that tells you exactly what to do that can build you this using OAuth 2 as the primary sort of cornerstone ingredient and does so in a way that is secure and repeatable and interoperable and uh, functional. Yeah, and you don't want to have to reinvent things. If there's something out there that everyone's using, then you're going to reach for it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, although, unfortunately, uh, the last number of years have shown us that a lot of developers fall into the trap of thinking that it would be easier for them to reinvent things. I'm just trying to think some of my use cases to see if I'm one of those. <laughs> it's extraordinarily common. And uh, so I work as a consultant now. And there have been a lot of times where I have walked into a group and like very, very smart and enthusiastic engineers have said, hey, look, we built this thing. And I'd looked like, do you know that there's, you know, this RFC that says how to do like 90% of what you're doing and also doesn't have this fixation vulnerability that you guys didn't see. So I would love to say that, yes, engineers don't want to reinvent wheels, but let's face it, we do. <laughs> but uh, when doing that, we should at least, uh, you know, I've done it too, but we should at least be aware of what wheels are out there so that whatever we're building ends up round, you know? Yeah. You know, we, we don't want to repeat the mistakes that other people have already figured out the answers to. I understand. Um... Cool. So I think we've spoken about tokens a lot. So yep. for those that haven't heard of, but I'm pretty sure most people will, JWTs, so JSON Web Tokens, I seem to think they're the standard way to do things, but you've rightly corrected me. Yeah, they are a standard way, and they're probably far and away the most common structured self-contained token format in the OAuth world. Question about that. But there are a lot of spaces still that use unstructured OAuth tokens. So the thing about OAuth is that in both OAuth 1 and OAuth 2, it doesn't care what this token is that you get out the far end. It doesn't care what its format is, doesn't care what it's made of. It's just, it's got to be, you got to be able to put it into an HTTP header. And other than that, you know, all bets are off. Is it something the client needs to know or is it just going to pass it back and forth? The client is just a dumb carrier of it, um, especially in OAuth 2. Going back to the differences in version 2 of the protocol, one of the things that we wanted to do was allow client applications to be as dumb as possible. Because you got to think about, when you're designing security for a system like this, you got to think about what motivations a client developer has. Or, or the developers of the different aspects of the system. So the authorization server, its job is to be a security component, right? You want your best security engineers uh, to be working on that to make sure uh, like all of the different uh, error branches are doing the right thing, that tracebacks aren't sending bad things in, into weird places, stuff like that. Think about a client developer though. They have something that they're trying to use an API. Mm -hmm. Like that's what they're trying to get done at the end of the day. They Security is something that gets in the way of somebody doing something awesome. Yeah. Right? And so security systems, I fundamentally and deeply believe, need to be able to live in the real world where they function when people don't actually care about them. Like, if you can give somebody a very simple recipe to follow, say, like, do this, do this, do this, and it works out pretty well, then I think that you're doing a pretty good job. And so uh, with OAuth tokens, the client has no idea what the format of the token is. So that left space uh, in the OAuth 2 world for innovation as to what to put into these tokens and, and for some standardization. And uh, as, as you rightly pointed out, the leading 
structure for token information is a JWT, JWT, JSON Web Token. And that is uh, RFC 7519, um, not to be confused with RFC 7591 that we've talked about, nor to be confused with RFC 7159, <laughs> which is JSON, uh, which I, I swear that the RFC editor was trolling me uh, when she assigned uh, RFC 7591, which had dependencies on 7519 and 7159. Five nine. For the listeners, just yes. look at the links at the end. <laughs> yeah, there's it's it's a soup of numbers, and if you've, although I will say, encourage any of your listeners, um, you know, if you come hang out with us in uh, the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the standards body where these uh, get defined, you, you'll be speaking in four digit numbers before you know it, and the weird thing is, the people around you will understand what you mean. It's very, it's a strange way. Yeah, I'm, I've actually joined the working group and see some of your comments on the, the OAuth stuff. I follow oh, fantastic. We're, uh, yeah, we're, uh, we're happy to have you there. Um, it is uh, open membership. You don't have to pay anything. You don't even have to get lawyers to sign off on anything. Um, just know that anything that you contribute is considered a contribution. And that's the beauty of standard-based work and RFCs. You know, it's all the product of collaboration. It really is. And... Um, the JOT specification uh, to get yeah. <laughs> let's, let's go back. Here. Let's go back. Right. Uh, the JOT specification was designed as a way to communicate information about what's been delegated from the authorization server to the resource server. Okay. Now, back in sort of traditional OAuth world, uh, in, and if you even look at the spec for OAuth 1, there was no differentiation between authorization server and resource server, it was just server. Mm -hmm. Because the assumption was that you had one machine that was running your API and you're going to have a function on that machine that generates and manages these tokens. So how do I know what a token is? You know, when a client makes a call to an API, how does that resource know what that token is? Well, it's just going to go look it up in the same database that it keeps everything else in. Mm -hmm. As the world started to get more distributed, and uh, to their credit, Google really uh, pushed a lot of the standards community in this direction, uh, thinking about more widely distributed systems from early days. The resource server needs to have other methods to figure out what this token is good for. And one of those methods is to just put information into the token itself. So when the token shows up, it uh, can carry a signature, so I can make sure that it was issued and signed by somebody whose key that I've trusted. And the token itself can tell me like, yeah, this is for this set of APIs and this set of actions at these APIs within this time window for this specific user. You can carry all of that information inside of the JSON web token. The downside of this is you're carrying all of that information inside the JSON web token. Mm -hmm. And you've, you're back to the same problem of the client signature secret. Exactly. To sign the token. Yeah, well, because cause the, well, the client is not signing this at all. This is okay. signed by the authorization server, and the client just carries so it. So it's just validating that it, it, it issued the token itself. Exactly, exactly. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't give you any protection about who's presenting the token. Mm. It only gives you information about who issued the token. So that's that's another downside with Jots is that uh, people sometimes mistakenly think it's giving you more than it than it actually is in terms of uh, protection and um, and sort of locking down the system. There are two other big drawbacks to Jot, and you know, as with any system, there are benefits and drawbacks. One of the drawbacks is with all of this information packed into the token, it not only gets potentially large, but it also uh, could be. Uh, bad for privacy. Mm -hmm. So what's in a token? It's, it's JSON. Yeah, it's, uh, it's JSON that's been wrapped up in its own special format. So if you look at it, it'll look like gibberish uh, to a human, but it is actually base64 URL encoded JSON, Okay. which is why most JOTs start with the characters EY capital J zero, yeah. because that's the base64 encoding of an open curly bracket. Oh, that makes sense. And it's, and it's three parts, isn't it? Yep. So you've got the first signed jots. You have a header, which is basically your cryptographic envelope information. You've got your payload, which says who issued the token, its sort of time constraints, expiry, and whatnot. 
uh, its audience constraints, uh, who the token was issued to, who it was authorized by, so you know potential usernames and things like that. And then you've got the signature that is over that whole system. One of the key innovations of the JWT specification is that the signature is calculated over that base64 URL encoded JSON as it's presented to you over the wire. Previous versions of signature-based document systems like XML DSIG, uh, and even some modern systems like uh, JSON-LD signatures require you to transform and normalize the document before you process or check the signature. With a JSON web token, you take it literally as is, which means it's very easy to get right. Mm -hmm. And with a cryptographic system, that is absolutely a feature that you want to have. Um, you know, uh, you want people to be able to get good signatures and validate good signatures very, very easily. Because otherwise, what people do is they'll just they'll turn off signature validation. If the normalization is screwing up one day, like, okay, we'll, we'll turn this off and we'll turn it on later. It'll be fine. Yeah. And of course, we all know that doesn't happen. So your, your jaw is three lots of base 64. You can, if you, if you saw it on your screen, you'd see the three full stops when you that separate that string. Yep, exactly. They're, yeah, they're, uh, for a signed jot, it's a base 64 URL encoded JSON, then a, a period, a full stop, then another one of those, and then a period, and then a base 64 URL encoded binary blob, which is the signature. Okay. And you could paste that into a service to decode that, couldn't yep. you? Yep, exactly. And uh, even without, you know, there are lots of libraries to do that today, but even without access to libraries, you really only need string split. So split it on the period character, mm -hmm. base64 URL decode to get your three sections, and then JSON parse the first two. Okay. And that doesn't give you signature validation, but it'll at least let you parse the payloads and headers and, um, and let you kind of run that through your system without even a, a, a JWT library. And that's why you have to be really careful about what you put in the token, because it's very easy to, to see it. Exactly. It, it's, uh, even though the client doesn't care what's in the token, that's a large, that's a far cry from the client not being able to see what's in the token. And so, which is one of the reasons why there are also encrypted jots, which are instead of three sections, there are five sections, because you've got the encryption key and the encrypted payload and the integrity vector and all, all these other bits and pieces. And those, when you base64 URL decode the payload, you're going to get encrypted gibberish because it has to be further decrypted based on okay. some key that the resource server would have to know. But the trade-off here, of course, is that now the resource server needs to have access to the private decryption key for that jot. Whereas before, it just needed to know the, the public signing key of the issuing server, which is really easy to distribute and make available because it's public. And what, what would you recommend if someone's thinking of not only using OAuth 2, but using JWT's jots for anything? Well, I would actually recommend that uh, you first consider a second major drawback here, and that's that jots are themselves, they, they contain their own state, which means that a jot is going to tell you if that jot is still valid, which is a really great thing if you've got uh, disadvantaged networks and you, know, uh, and you want things to be uh, highly performant, everything can be processed locally. But the downside, there, there's no way to revoke a jot once it's in flight if nobody's going to be doing any checks on that. Like, because the jot itself is going to say that it's valid. And if you're only checking the jot itself, you'll never know that somebody went and revoked it. Yeah, the, there's a lot of talk around um, using those tokens for session cookie replacements, you know, in, mm -hmm. in your browser. And which brings me on to the other example of single page JavaScript type apps. Mm -hmm. Well, they'll go and request and save a token in the browser, but then you have that mm -hmm. exact problem you've just explained where you can't expire it, you can't update it because you've messed with the signature, Right. you can't revoke it. So once it's been saved on that user's browser, it's mm -hmm. vulnerable to all the different types of attacks out there. It is the attacks and the information leakage like we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we did with the uh, heart profile uh, that you mentioned in the intro there. That's right. I'll put a big circle around that to make sure it's in the show notes. <laughs> Absolutely. So one of the things that we did with the heart profiles is 
uh, that that's a set of profiles for uh, OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, and User Managed Access, or UMA, that are specific to the healthcare world. And okay. when you're accessing uh, health records, uh, the you know, thus the clever name for the uh, for the working group heart. But when you're working in the healthcare world, uh, there are a lot of times where the the number of checks that uh, security checks that you want to make are going to be kind of dependent on what is being asked for. Like if somebody is getting just like really broad demographic research information and stuff like that, it's like, okay, and I've seen this token again from the same place within a couple of seconds, then yeah, you know, I, I really don't need to check this again. But if somebody is getting, say, you know, uh, HIV status information for a specific patient, and I've never seen this token before, and the token looks like it was actually issued a while ago, but I'm only just now seeing it, because mm -hmm. all of that information can be encoded in the JOT, well, I might want to be able to go look that up, you know, or go to the financial world. If somebody is just checking their basic account balances, you want that to be nice and fast, nice and performant. You can just check the information in the JOT itself. But then when you get to that next step of, yeah, and now I want you to send money, or I want you to send a lot of money, you really, really want to make sure that token is still good, right? So at that point, you can go and use a protocol called OAuth token introspection. And that's a really simple web protocol where the resource server can go talk back to the authorization server and say, hey, one, it can authenticate itself. So I am this resource server, you've seen me before. Mm -hmm. And somebody just gave me this token, what is it good for? You know, is it still active? Who is it issued to? All of that stuff. You can then put all of that information in the response of that introspection call instead of having to bake it into the token. Plus, it allows you to go in and validate at runtime that the token is still there. You know, it's still good. So a double layer of validation. Exactly. Both JOT and introspection were defined separately, but they can be used together. And that's one of the things that we did with the heart specifications. And token introspection, uh, incidentally, that is what's behind RFC, you know, that is RFC 7662. Uh, and again, I helped serve as the uh, editor for that one. Okay. So, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people ask ask me kind of what, you know, what would I recommend? Would I recommend jots? Would I recommend introspection? And it largely depends on like, what is it that you're actually trying to accomplish? And we've seen the same sort of uh, back and forth pull in the security space for many, many years. I mean, look, look at what we do with WebPKI now, right? You get a certificate and the certificate itself has signatures on it from a CA that has probably been pre-placed and pre-packaged and dropped into your browser. And that's all very fast check, you know, highly performant, highly scalable. But we realize that, you know, a revoked certificate is something that people want to know about. Yeah. So we started publishing certificate revocation lists. Those started to get unwieldy, so we came up with OCSP, which is a protocol that allows you to say, hi, I just got a certificate. Is it any good? Which might just sound familiar from the description from the yeah. conversation we were just having about token introspection. Like uh, none of this is really new, and and this brings me to, um, if I may, one of my favorite jokes in computer science. There are really only two hard problems in computer science: naming things, cache consistency, and off by one errors. Yeah. We hear that a lot in the sh in all the different <laughs> shows. It's one of my favorite too. I, I I love that one, and this is very squarely cache consistency. Like yeah. uh, when you get something, you yeah, you're revalidating something. Really. Yeah, exactly. So introspection allows you to do that runtime validation, but there's a cost to that. You got to go out across the network and figure out, um, you know, and you got to make the call, and you got to have the resource servers have things associated with them so that uh, you can validate them and all of that other stuff. Okay. Could we quickly go through the grant type options I would have as a developer? If we take the web example, the single page app example, it's a client based, client based and server based. So if I'm doing a mobile app. Absolutely. Yeah. So this used to be a much more, not difficult question, but a question with a much longer answer. 
Because these days, best practice is honestly to use the authorization code flow for all of these different things. Okay. Um, so it used to be the recommendation was to use what's called the implicit flow for browser-based applications. And the implicit flow does everything through browser redirects instead of having these direct HTTP calls. A large reason for that was that back in 2010, JavaScript was very, very limited. Cores did not exist yeah. as a technology. But these days, we c in, nor did post message, nor did a lot of other stuff that we have today. And we can do a much, much better job. Uh, Cross-origin resource so, sharing. Yeah, where the browser's making a request, yeah. I think. Exactly, when the browser's making a direct request uh, within JavaScript, uh, oh, as opposed to a what we would call a back-channel call. And so now JavaScript applications, in-browser applications, SPAs and the like, can actually do that. And... So it makes a lot more sense to use the authorization code flow even in those spaces okay. than, than it may be used to. With native applications, the auth code flow has always been the recommended best practice, but we have an additional technology today called Pixie. That's uh, Proof Key for Code Exchange, P-K-C-E. Okay. And uh, that's because uh, you know nerds will never turn down a chance to have a cute name for something. <laughs> and... Um, What's clever about Pixie is that it allows you to protect that exchange of the authorization code without using a client secret. Okay. Effectively, what you're doing is when you start off the process, the client creates a secret and sends a hash of that secret with its request, its initial request for the token. And then when uh, the authorization code comes back to the client, it sends the unhashed secret along with the authorization code. And the authorization server can then knit those two together and say like, oh yeah, I saw the hash of this secret before. So I know that you are the piece of software that made that initial request, even though you haven't necessarily been pre-registered. You know, I, you, I have not given you some compile time secret. You haven't done dynamic registration. And, you know, you can prove to me that you are the one that started this transaction. Oh, I like it. And um, so people are looking at um, tooling. Is, and how new is that? Uh, Pixie is also a few years old. Um, okay. So yeah, Pixie is very well established. Uh, if you're working on mobile applications today, um, honestly, I would tell all of your listeners to use Google's app auth libraries for both uh, Android okay. and iOS. Um, and yeah, if we could provide a link to that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure people would appreciate note. that. <laughs> and, um, because that includes Pixie, it includes, but it also includes all sorts of other sort of mobile best practices, uh, just, you know, ensconced in an open source library that you can just use. So you, so you don't have to reinvent this. We've kind of got a clear choice now between the grant type. That was one of my mm -hmm. points I wanted to go through, which is. The original one it yeah it really is uh, everything else in oauth 2 was uh, invented as an optimization of the mm -hmm. authorization code flow so the there are others one that still does make sense is the client credentials grant type but that's the one you use when there's not a user involved at all okay so you've got two back-end systems where we would traditionally use an api key the client credentials grant uh, gives you the ability to effectively still have an API key, but that API key is for getting OAuth tokens as opposed to getting the actual API data. The key here is that the resource servers downstream now only have to care about access tokens. Mm -hmm. So they get in an access token and they can validate that. We've got, as we've been talking about, we've got the tools to do that with introspection and Jot and you know database and service lookup type stuff. We can already do all of that. We no longer have to manage and distribute API keys to however many API servers there might be floating out there. Uh, it lets us uh, centralize our concerns into dedicated security components. Because I know I would rather have a, a very, very strong, some might say single point of failure, but I would rather have one strong single point of failure than 100 equally weak single points of failure. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you mentioned the framework that you recommend there. I would guess that you don't want to be rolling any of this yourself. 
No, um, you can get away with it on the client side and do a decent decent enough job, but there's a lot of best practice uh, documents that you would probably want to uh, read up on. Uh, there's a best practice document from the IETF on mobile applications. There is one that is being written right now for uh, in-browser applications. And that's the BCP. Yes, yes, yeah. best current practice BCP. And those sort of collect all of the best advice. Oh, and uh, one note I want to make about single-page apps before we get off this entirely is that it turns out that the way people are building and deploying single-page apps, a lot of them don't actually need OAuth. Okay. Because just about every single-page app is going to be talking to a first-party API backend, which itself might need to go do and talk to a third-party API. But it turns out to be very rare for a uh, an application to really need anything more than a session cookie to talk to its backend systems. As an aside, that's how I've done something that I was working on. Yeah. It issues a session cookie. So if there's one lesson you could teach every developer out there regarding authorization, what would it be? Oh, that's a great question. So... Um... I would say that authorization is one of those things that looks like it's really, really simple. It's just, oh, I'm trying to call my API and I need to do this thing. I'm So how hard could it be? But there are so many places that it can go sideways that absolutely read the best practices, um, use not just libraries, but you know, trusted libraries. OAuth has been around long enough that there's a lot of really good, well-established community work that's out there that's available on any platform that you can think of and also you know keep an eye out uh for the fact like we were just talking about with single page apps that sort of oauth and this authorization delegation might not actually be the solution that your problem needs mm -hmm. you know oauth is a tool and it's a very powerful and very elegant tool for doing a one specific thing but it's not a panacea. You can't just add it to a system and then magically get security. And a lot of the limitations of OAuth is where the XYZ project that I'm working on now is that's really where we're trying to pick up from that. Okay. Where can people find out more, you know, more about your XYZ project or get involved? Yeah. So that is available on the website OAuth.xyz. And it's named XYZ because... At a conference dinner, I bought the domain oauth.xyz on a bit of a lark. <laughs> and then a couple of months later, this project started up. So that's that's its name. Uh, I will be uh, presenting this at uh, the XYZ work at the Identifers conference in DC, which will unfortunately, by the time listeners hear this, uh, that will have passed. Okay. But the good news is that uh, if, uh, if they weren't there in person, then... Um, videos of that presentation will be made available uh, within the coming months. Yep, and the slides will be available too. And I will link those off of the OAuth.xyz website when those are made available as well. Okay. Plus, um, if you are getting involved with uh, the IETF OAuth working group, I will be presenting this at Montreal. And we'll see if uh, there's appetite in the community for, uh, for moving the OAuth protocol forward in this direction or not. Um, but I think there's some exciting stuff because OAuth has been a really fantastic tool and it's going to be around for a long time. I mean, it, it does what it does really, really well. But what's really getting me excited now is solving the problems that OAuth doesn't do well. And I think we're we're in a good position to start really doing that. Okay, I look forward to um, getting you on again. Fantastic. I would be happy to happy to come back anytime. Excellent. Justin, thank you for coming on the show. It's been a real pleasure and you've answered all the things I've had buzzing around my head for the past couple of months and hopefully the listeners too. This is Gavin Henry for Software Engineering Radio. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at sc-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening. <laughs>